What you're about to see is Carl Shelton and Ron Davis pitch for £700,000 worth of funding for a textbook office to residential conversion project in Farnham. Now this pitch for funding went out on the hit Sky TV show Property Elevator. If you haven't seen the show before, it's a bit like Dragon's Den. Uh, people come along and pitch their property projects for funding. And the people they pitch to are five angel investors who are Nicholas Walwork, Helen Chorley, John Howard, Paul Mahoney, and myself, Ranjan Bhattacharya. Now, what we show you here is the pitch as it went out on TV. And every now and then what I'm going to do is freeze the action uh, to give you my reaction and analysis of what's going on. Now we've got quite a few of these and we've put them all in a property elevator playlist on this channel. So make sure you watch some of the uh, other pitches because you'll learn plenty from them. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon. We put out plenty of property investing content each and every week, all dedicated to keeping you on top of your property investment game. Now, Cal Shelton and Ron Davis are pitching for £700,000 worth of funding. Cal Shelton is actually known to us here. He attended our um, groundbreaking commercial property eight-week training course, where really he learned the tricks of the trade of hunting for and putting together commercial conversion deals just like this. If you want to find out more details about that eight-week course, there's a link in the description uh, and check that out. But for now, let me hand you over to Elizabeth Warburton, the show's presenter, as she meets uh, Cal and Ron. Gents, it's lovely to have you with us today. Where Good have you come here. from? Uh, I come from Cardiff. Okay, both of you? Walthamstow in London. Very far away. Yeah, well, I do I work in London and then, yeah, come, okay. from, come from Wales. Great, so what's the deal that you brought today then? This is our commercial conversion. Right. So we want to move into commercial conversion space because of new community development rights yeah. coming to play. Yeah. And this is our first deal that we want to get off the ground and, and going to Brilliant. build up our experience in that space. Uh, and so how much are you after today from the Angels? 697,000. Okay, very specific number. Yeah. And what's your GDV hoping to be? Uh, 2.63. We're primarily looking for investors and to build a relationship with anyone on the panel. So yeah. um, we'd love to get all their contact details and work with all of them. Yeah. But um, I suppose whoever gives us the best deal will probably walk away with them. Happy. Brilliant. All right. Well, fingers crossed for you. Good Thank luck. You. Cheers. And I'll have a little chat to you when you get out. Hi, Cal and Ron. What have you got for us today? What's the deal? Uh, John, uh, I'm Cal Shelton and uh, I'm an accountant. And this is um, a commercial conversion that we have. And we're looking for £697,000 investment. So this is a commercial to residential conversion in a building that looks rather sexy. It looks a handsome building. Uh, now, the thing is with uh, office to residential conversions, if they actually look like some 60s or 70s office monstrosity, then they don't actually look from the curb um, as a place where people would want to live. This building has the advantage that it looks like a um, nice set of um, upmarket residential flats on the outside. So converting this from commercial to residential use shouldn't be too much of a big deal. It's in Farnham. Um, it is... Uh, three-story building as you can see it's currently um, tenanted as uh, law offices and it's tenanted at 50,000 pounds but we'll be purchasing it vacant possession uh, the tenancy expires end of April um, it's advertised 750,000 pounds but the agent has said to us that they're receiving offers above that and we intend to beat that price in our offer now this is very common with commercial property in that there isn't actually a fixed asking price, there's more of a guide price. The reason for that vagueness is that um, it might be worth something to you, but it might be worth something more or less to someone else. Commercial property is often priced like this with a guide price rather than a fixed asking price. That's because the value of commercial property is in the eyes of the beholder. Now, what I mean by that is, you see, commercial property is not valued in the same way residential property is. The value of a commercial property uh, depends on how much cash flow you can get out of it. So quite frankly, if you've got a plan to get more cash flow out of a property than the next guy, then you can afford to pay more for it. And that's why having the right knowledge sets you in pole position. 
Because if you know stuff that the other guy doesn't, then you can get a higher value out of a commercial property and therefore afford to pay more for it in the first place and still make your figures stack up. It's freehold title and it's not elected for VAT has a gross total area of 5,498 square feet. In the pack, you've got some photos. You can see it's a handsome kind of period building. Um, it's, we've got rough floor plans, although we understand that the existing floor plans that we received aren't actually accurate. Um, we have done a site visit and taken some measurements, but we weren't able to go into all of the rooms um, because of the existing yep. use. Yep. The basement we haven't been into, but we understand that it is dry. That's where they store all of their paperwork. Um, so we've done some conservative proposed plans. Um, and as you can see from there, we've, um, we've kind of retained a communal access to the garden. Uh, we've got 10 flats, mix, mixture of one and two bedroom flats. Um, and we're retaining the uh, cycle and refuse access through the side door as is uh, currently existing. Ah, okay. We'd be looking to get planning approval, convert it into uh, residential use, of course, and then uh, sell off the uh, final product. So we're going to do the development ourselves. What did I say? I said, that has to be done by an accountant. There you go. I, I, I just knew it. I love it. It's the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> well done, mate. Uh, so I'm a planning consultant by training. Uh, so I head up kind of planning and design side of things. And as you've guessed, Cal is an accountant. Um, so we work in partnership and uh, try and find deals. So we've got a commercial site filtering kind of process. So sites come through to us and then we work on those together. Uh, and we've got a bit of a track record of planning game on residential um, sites, so intensification of residential and existing residential areas. Sounds like a great uh, business combination, this duo here. Uh, we've got an accountant who's obviously very good with the numbers. You've got a planning consultant uh, who obviously understands the planning system and the PD system. You've got Cal, of course, who's been on uh, our commercial property conversion training course. So it seems like a pretty dynamic duo. So yeah, we've been working together for the last three years and um, most of our sites of, or our track record so far has been residential new build plots, uh, small plots on land in South London. And we want to enter into the commercial space of converting commercial buildings. Good. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, who would like to start first? I'm happy to. I bet you are. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a thing of beauty. You know, cash flow is something we harp on about. And it's so important to work out when you need that money and project that forward. So this is amazing. Now, talk to me about hard contingency. Yes, yeah, so we've got a hard contingency of 10% on the bill costs. Mm -hmm. Um, priced in the conversion cost at £120 per square foot. Um, noting that I haven't, we haven't done a commercial conversion, we do want to start doing that. I mean, I've got experience in doing loft conversions or ground floor extensions on, on buildings, but I haven't done a commercial conversion. So I've, I've kind of gone by what I feel is correct in terms of what the price is and 10% contingency. Um, I know 75 so I think 12.5 is, is the standard contingency you put in. So I just thought 10% is probably where we want to be. And the maximum price that you've worked out that you could pay is 1.028, right? That's above that, it doesn't really work, right? In terms of what your return profile is and what you want to see on your return. So for us, we're aiming for a 20% return on GDV and be 25% return on total costs. So if we go, yeah, if we go above that price, that's where, for us, it's not worthwhile doing. And I think for you, or for us to bring that to you, probably something you not going to want to invest in. And the proposal is 60-40 uh, in our favour, right? That's what I, that's the proposal, okay, yes. Great, thank you. What I like in your pack, and it's one of the best I've seen, is the way, I mean, a lot of people think permitted development is just a rubber stamping exercise, but there are fixed criteria that you have to conform to. Absolutely. And I love the way you've evaluated it. You've evaluated this site against all the PD criteria for office to residential conversion. Mm -hmm. And another thing I really like is that a lot of people just say 5,000 square foot, how many 37 square metre flats they can get in it. But that's not, uh, you have to think about the layout of each floor. Yep. And what you've done is actually a block plan to show how they would actually fit into the space. So you've had to do a mixture of two beds and one beds. And I think that's all very, very sensible, the way you've taken into that into account. So I think you guys are a great combination there. Thank you. Um, so the, the proposition that you're proposing is based... So I think um, a couple of things that they've said there, I mean, which I, I, I remember this one, it was, I loved it really. Um, they had actually uh, not left any stone unturned. 
Um, you can convert commercial buildings to residential use under permitted development. That means you submit your application and in 56 days they have to give it to you, provided you meet certain criteria. And it's just very important that you understand exactly what those criteria are and you can put a firm tick, not a grey tick, not a pencil tick, but a firm tick in each one of those boxes. And if you can do that and demonstrate that alongside your application, then you will get the permission to convert it to residential. Basically to sell these on. And I understand that you're looking at that 20% margin uh, minimum. So I guess, um, I think your costs are pretty well, uh, very, very thoroughly analysed. Where are you based from? Uh, I'm I think they cut a little bit out there, <laughs> but I think what I went on to say was I'm not really convinced that working on a 20% margin and paying a million pounds for that property is really sensible in the current market. Um, I really think you need to be working at uh, in excess of 30% margin to make your figures stack up if you're doing projects today. We put out a video very recently talking about 30% margin with a case study from a couple of my mastermind students who are doing a commercial to residential conversion in Richmond where they're achieving in excess of that. So we'll put a link to that, you can watch that afterwards, but let's carry on watching this for now. Based in North Wales. Okay. Uh, kind of and between North Wales and London, I work down here. Okay, great. And obviously you're a planning consultant, which you've just hit upon one of the the concerns I'd have with, with any conversion is the parking. Yeah. Um, bike and bin stores possibly sorted already down the side, so that doesn't seem too much of an issue. But with the car parking, have you spoken to any relevant, any local planning consultants regarding the parking? No, no, haven't been able to do okay. that as yet. Um, the proposal would be for it to be a car-free scheme. Uh, it's control, course, yeah. control parking Plastic area. No parking. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. whether that would be approved or not before you buy it, because yeah. if, it's, if it's not likely to be approved, um, you're gonna be in, you'd be bought, yeah. a, bought a lemon, but. So that's a big bit of due diligence. Absolutely. That you so it is, it is a need to do. There is a car parking um, restrictive zone in the area, so we can guarantee under a lease to any future occupiers that it is a car free scheme. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Planning policy in the area seeks car parking for new developments. It's so obviously under PD. The planning department might resist it, um, but I think under the MPPF we'd be quite confident um, that it kind of ticks okay. all the boxes of sustainable development. The the one twenty pound per square foot build cost. Is that from someone? Is that have you have you consulted someone on that, or are you just pretty confident you can hit that number? That's Given it's a conversion, there may need to be walls moved, all the rest. I haven't spoke to a, to our builder or any builders about that price. Just that's something of experience and guesstimation. Fair enough. Am I fair to say that's a pretty maybe a bit light in the current market? Perhaps. I would I would think 120 pounds is light. It's so it is so difficult. Yeah. We understand that. Yeah. I don't think you're too far off on that. You mentioned so you mentioned about the comparables and you know um, obviously you know there's a broad range of them and we've got bottom end and top end and you mentioned about premium product. What what's going to make this a premium product? What do I do diligence in terms of looking what has actually sold at the price range we're looking at? Just the Lionsgate example I gave from the agent I spoke to. Um, look at the products that he's selling. Uh, understand what they look like. Um, but I don't think there's crazy amounts to it. It's it's a good fit out, isn't it? It's a nice new kitchen. Yeah. Good decorating, a nice bathroom. I suppose that just sort of ties in a little bit with my previous question. Yeah. I think it goes it goes a little bit further than that. I mean, you, you might want underfloor heating, you might want tiling, better quality tiling in okay. living rooms, better quality mm -hmm. flooring rather than yeah. vinyl Definitely. in bathrooms. You want yeah. quality tiles. You, do you sort of mean it? Yeah. There's quite a lot goes to it. You want chrome fittings for all the light fittings. No, no, I mean, I think it's going on a bit here. I mean, look, at the end of the day, you refurbish the flats to what the market uh, demand is. So you're looking at um, the end price uh, for those one and two bedroom flats in that area and look around at similar developments that are going up uh, for the price bracket of flat that you're going to create. Who's putting up similar one and two bedroom flats? Go and have, actually have a look at some of them, see the standard and try to be about there or if you want a quick sell and you want to absolutely guarantee that you, uh, your, your, your product flies off the shelf, just make it a little bit better. It's as simple as that. The light fittings themselves need to be a better quality. Yeah. The yeah. front door might want to be a thicker, more substantial door. You get that feel of quality as you, as you go in. Yeah. It, there's quite a lot to it and I think... I think um, is banged on too much about the finishes. Uh, you've got to look at the other aspects of costs, which is why I thought they were reasonably on the mark with this one. And, and that is, when you do a conversion, the more sympathetic 
or in harmony you are with the actual building, the better. So with this particular project, the way that they have designed the one and two bedroom flats um, to basically use existing load bearing walls, existing hallway stairs, uh, staircases and landings and all of that was all in harmony with the way the building flows as it is. So therefore, the conversion works will not be on the high side as if it, compared to if you had to remove tons of load bearing walls, move staircases and this and that and do a lot of structural changes as well. Um, so, so, so that's why I think that some of Nick's points here aren't um, too relevant to this particular deal. There's a, what's slightly out of kilter is your build cost versus what you're saying is you want for the quality. Mm -hmm. £120 per square foot would be a budget cost, I would say, if we are talking build cost. Yep. That's my feeling for it. And, and my only other concern is that the top floor with restricted roof height, I'm not sure you're going to be competing on the top floor as a quality product because I think it will be even more restricted with the, the space you've got up Quite there. Quite interesting though. Top he is right about the restricted um, ceiling height being a problem. But if you actually look at the shape of this building, I don't think it is. I don't think it is a problem in this case. And that's because of the angle of the roof. If you see the angle of the roof, it's actually quite steep. And if you look at where the roof meets the sort of top of the window there on the third floor, you can actually see it's one of those roofs which actually affords quite good head height and doesn't really offer much of a restriction at all. So I don't think that would be a problem with the design of this particular building. The, one, the main reason for that is if you look at the shape of this building from the outside, um, it was built that way. The loft room, the loft floor wasn't an afterthought or an extension or, if, or in, an addition several years after. It was built like that from the very beginning. And when you see buildings which are built like that, where the, the roof space, it was always meant to be a floor, you tend to find that the pitch of the roof is actually um, at a steeper angle, which gives you much more uh, ceiling height. So it just looks nice from the outside, but it doesn't feel like any restriction on the inside. Top floors, I mean, some people, some people love Quirky. them because of the character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When someone comes in and says, I'm going to produce a premium product, alarm bells ring. Mm -hmm. Because what that means is, for me, that they're going to push the resale value as hard as possible because allegedly it's going to be a premium. I'm not really interested in premium. That's a bonus. I'm more interested in what I know I can sell them for. Does the square footage include the basement? Now, fully agree with John. Um, I don't think is, that's exactly what Cal and Ron meant. John is absolutely right. You don't want to go um, uh, heavy on premium fittings and fixtures in a flat because ultimately there's a price per square foot of uh, end value which is the ceiling price for flats in that area and it doesn't matter what you do to the inside you'll find it very very difficult to breach that. What they're talking about is operating on a budget and through good design um, giving it a premium uh, finish look and feel. That is a completely different proposition. We've Yes. Yeah. And how yeah. much is the square, how, how big is the basement? It's 24 square meters. So it's 200, 250 square feet. Yeah. Okay. And you're not doing anything with that, presume it's just storage. Uh, we were going to use it. We were going to use it to the. You're not going to try and do a ranjan and squeeze every last ounce out of out of out of. Uh... So we did actually have. That's very very mean and a shocking uh, shot across my bow there from uh, John. Um, it is worth squeezing um, every last ounce, as John put it, out of a development. Because what is a developer? What is the job of a developer? Your job as a developer to take um, so a square footage of real estate and develop every inch of that space to its maximum potential. That is the job of a developer. Now, there are some parts of a building that are less worth developing than others. Basements are one of those areas and should be done with caution. If you haven't got um, a decent head height, or if you haven't got natural light already there, or if it needs a lot of uh, damp proofing uh, or underpinning or anything like that, then the cost benefit might not be in the favor of converting that space. Two sets of floor plans, the ones that we've included yes. in our yeah. pack. 
do use the basement because um, it allows us to get up to 10 units and keep the main front door and the side door. There's already a staircase that goes down okay. there that we and could access from. What, what's from that going to be a bedroom down there or something? No. Dungeon? So, the, <laughs> so under PD, the habitable rooms need to have light. So we would have the uh, living and dining room and bedroom on the top floor. And then the idea would be to create a kind of light well somewhere and then have yeah. well, kitchen that and one, bathroom That downstairs. one won't be worth 550 a foot. The, the other thing I just wanted to touch on. Now that sounds a bit more of an expensive conversion than if they're looking at uh, incorporating the basement into uh, the ground floor flats as opposed to making the basement separate flats in their own right. It also comes a cropper with minimum space standards because the minimum space standards require duplex flats to be larger than if the flat was all on one floor. Is the 5,000 or 550 square metres or whatever it is, um, is, that, is, that, is that a gross, including all hallways and stairs? Or is that net of each flat? It's just that the flat square it's footage. Just the flats. Yeah. It's the flat yeah. square footage. We haven't included Because a lot of people, and you haven't got into, you haven't fallen into that trap, so well done. But a lot of people come in and say, oh, it's, it's this. And then when you analyse it, it's not. There is a possible exit once the planning is, you've got that, then to kind of flip that on. What, what are the numbers? I'm sorry, there's a lot of numbers and I love that, but what are the numbers with that exit? If it was land and we we're building this from scratch, I could give you a price, but because it's a conversion, I, we're not familiar with that. I don't know what that price would be. So I, that's something that we would need to assess. Should I give you the price something. now? Yeah, please. In my view, if you're paying around a million for it, you get planning, there's little chance of turning it for a profit. You've got stamps you take into account, you've got numerous other costs funding by that because you have bought it you've held it six months or whatever so it, it would be difficult i think unless you can buy it subject to planning john is correct to a large extent on this particular point i think when you do a um a, what's, what's under discussion here is not actually building the project out but flipping the site on once it's got the benefit of planning now, when you do, um, if I apply for planning permission to build 10 houses in a field and I get that planning permission, that planning permission has a lot of value attached to it because, quite frankly, it's quite hard to get. Uh, it's very uncertain whether I'm going to get it. Uh, planning departments can be a right pain to uh, work with, and they usually are. And it can take years to get that planning permission. That's why when I've actually got planning consent to build my 10 houses in a field somewhere, it actually adds value to the raw site of the land. P permitted development is a different ball game. It's permitted development, as the name suggests, because the development is permitted, subject to you meeting some predefined criteria. And it only takes 56 days to get your application passed. So that's why if you go along and pick a site like this, it's pretty obvious, it's reasonably obvious for people that have been properly trained in, in, in assessing commercial sites to just see it and, and assess that, yes, you will get permitted development for this. And you put in your application, you show you've met all the criteria and 56 days later, you've got it. So because the risk and the work, if you like, isn't that much to simply getting the, pl the planning permission in place, then you haven't added too much value to the building. So the chances of flipping this uh, on with the benefit of planning without actually doing the work on a site this size um, wouldn't be worthwhile, as John says. In terms of our negotiating, uh, view, view of negotiating, it, it's uh, to go for the highest price we could possibly go for, but to try and win the site, um, but subject to us getting planning within six I months. I never like being the highest bid. No. I like being well down the line and then having to come to me, crawl to me six months later and say, sorry, John, we didn't take you off very seriously at the time, but guess what? Now we'd like to accept it because all the others have fallen through. Now so that in a place like this, it's not likely to happen. I'd say that. So just to well, that's very as John said, it's very area dependent. I don't know what areas he's talking about, but in areas of very high demand, that doesn't really happen like that. My um, 
surefire way of getting deals is to be the highest bidder. Because if you're not the highest bidder, you don't win them. And you be the highest bidder and still make money because you've got a better plan than the next guy. And having a better plan is reliant on you having the knowledge of what is possible. An example of that, well, I've won projects where I have, I know that I can get 10 flats out of a building, whereas the competition think you can only get eight flats out of a building. Now, if you know that you can get 10 and other people are doing all their figures on eight, then of course you can afford to pay more for the building, be the highest bidder and still win that uh, property. Now, doing that is reliant on knowledge. Uh, if you want to get that knowledge, I run an eight-week commercial property course. Uh, it's the leading commercial property course in the country. It's the only one that's accredited by the Property Investors Accreditation Scheme. If you want to get it on it, the link is in the description below. It's also on the screen here, succeedingproperty.com forward slash workshop. And you may want to join our mastermind program. I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of the video. It's a 12-month mastermind program dedicated for commercial property investors and uh, people doing commercial to residential conversions. The link is also on the screen in the description below. To clarify, your offer will be a subject to offer or unconditional? Unconditional. It will be unconditional. I'm struggling to get past. Well, of course, really, if you're making an offer on a commercial property looking to convert it to residential under permitted development, you will rarely get your offer accepted uh, if it's conditional on getting the planning. That's normally for you to do your due diligence, do your homework, be equipped with the knowledge before you make the offer and do it unconditionally. Past the, 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 the likelihood of the build cost being light and, it, and the contrast to it being a premium product, you know, based upon what I've seen lately and what the guys have said, for it to be a premium product, it's going to be more like 150 plus, which is, you know, another 160, 170 grand on build cost, which does eat into the profit quite a bit. The way we work out our numbers is to work backwards from the GDV that we need to, not GDV, the return on GDV that we need to hit. So, I mean, absolutely update. I, I, was, I think we the, might be being a bit, getting caught up a bit on that, Paul, to be fair. Maybe I think it's we, difficult we because I mean, you know, you can you can do a deal on bathrooms and kitchens and it's more the finish rather than the kitchens and the bathrooms. It's yeah. it's the finish. At the end of the day, these flats are gonna unit price you know, pretty much two fifty to three fifty. Yeah. So you're talking about the spec for that level of the market. The other thing on your build cost, which I'll say which is complimentary, is that I like the way you've worked with the existing fabric of the building. So you build your, without too much structural alteration. So many of these chimneys are all still in place and you work the design uh, in a way that would keep that building cost low. So I actually think your building cost is reasonably realistic for doing these sort of conversions. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you guys are great and I think you've got a really good opportunity to do some great business together. You know, this deal isn't for me. Um, we do a lot of stuff in the Thames Valley, so I know this area really well. Um, I'm developing a, a client site there at 30,000 square foot office conversion at the moment with them in, in Fleet. So it's just down the road. So I know, know this area very well. I know the price per square foot we're paying for that. And it's quite a bit more than you're stating. It's, it's over 150 pounds a square foot. And that is a premium product in an equally premium area. Um, so I don't think this deal works. I think it's going to become too marginal. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think you'll get it subject to planning and, and with all those risks, I don't think this one quite works for you. I think you can find a better deal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My thoughts are similar to Nick Nicholas's on this. As it stands, it's not juicy enough for me. When I start looking at the return on investment and current numbers, and actually it's more about the IRR for me. So I love that you've included in that, that, in, that in there. I also love the risk and sensitivity analysis, which again, you know, you can see yourself a 10% dip and you start getting a little bit more marginal, right? And that's what that's what I'm looking at. If there was a possibility of exit one happening, which now we think is probably not, then I would have made you an offer. So not on this occasion, but this is this is outstanding. So thank you. Thank you. I think both of you are very investable. I think it's a great combination having an accountant and a planning consultant. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, as John yeah. loves to that's say, accountants are usually team. afraid to cross the road, and that's not a bad thing yeah. because you can hold, you know, a bit more um, 
you know, Larry people like us back. Yep. Um, and planning consultant, obviously, if there's a chance of getting planning on this, you're going to get it, hopefully. My other concern is 700 grand investment is toward the upper end of what I'd be comfortable putting into one deal, but this deal doesn't tick all the boxes. Um, maybe it does if it gets the planning. So I'd be willing to offer you what you want, but only if one of the other angels are willing to share it with me. Just remind me what the net profit is. 526k. What you've done is outstanding. You, you know, you, you put me to shame when I look at that. It's fantastic. Um, the deal is just the sort of deal we do all day long, will our eyes shut, not a problem at all. But the margin is a bit tight and I think there'll be a lot of competition. If you put an offer in of 750, 800,000 and if they come back to you, in a few months' time, because the buyer they did have has fallen through, then certainly give me a ring because I'd be delighted to do it with you. But at, at the one million, it's just that little bit. It's that I can see why you you'll have to bid that, by the way. Yeah. But I but mm -hmm. I just think for me that's it's it's just a little bit tight. But I can bring a lot of value, I believe, to the deal for you because we've done so many of these before. So thank you today for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Hmm. I like this. I like you guys as well. I think you are a great team. I think we could make a great team as well. Interestingly enough, we do a lot of these sort of projects in these prosperous commuter towns um, outside the M25 and all of that. O so outside the M25. Outside? Hold oh, yeah. on a minute. Amateur, you only work inside. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. He suddenly towns. changed his tactics. No, 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 no. no. You said I'm very much outside the M25. Really? I don't know why they uh, try to poo-poo on my parade here, you know, just as I'm making an offer. But we do deals up and down the country, and so do uh, our students. But anyway, let's see what we are offering here. <laughs> these, sort of, these sort of commuter towns you are right six up months ago. You weren't, yeah? you weren't two months ago, apart from Leicester. Listen, I, I really like the way you've uh, uh, thought about everything here. And simply because of what we do. And, you know, I'm one of the few people that have actually done multiple class G and class MA projects, even though these rules are just a few months old, we've actually got these permissions through and started works on some of these. So I think we can add a lot. Um, but I think you're over offering. One of the things that um, we do on our projects, we, we're not often the highest bidder when, <laughs> we, when we win our projects. And that's by um, putting, to, because in many times, it's credibility of the team uh, that wins the bid. So we've, we've been successful bidders in these sort of situations by presenting our offer in a certain way where we're not necessarily the top bidder, but we are present it in a way that's guaranteed to get it through. So I think on your terms, this is fine, but at a maximum price of 800. And because I'm feeling exceptionally generous, I'd be happy uh, to work with this fellow here or on my own because I think us young angels on the panel should stick together. <laughs> um, so that's my offer to you. Either um, we can do it, uh, we can do it with us on a maximum price of 800, or we can do it together if Paul wants to work with me. Yeah, of course. To be fair, if you work. Now that's a key point about the presentation of the offer. We run a 12 month mastermind program for commercial property investors. And basically we're putting in offers uh, and helping our students put offers in on properties up and down the country. And the key point of those offers is the team behind it and establishing the credibility of the buyer. Because what the vendor doesn't want or the vendor's agent doesn't want is basically people to be all excited at the, build at the beginning. They haven't done all their due diligence, they haven't got all their ducks in the row, and a couple of weeks later, three or four weeks later, they back out and they add more time delay, marketing costs, vacancy costs, and just more costs for the vendor in a failed aborted transaction. So credibility of the buyer uh, is often as important as getting the maximum price. To get, if you work together, so I just just point out if you work together 
an extra 50 grand either way is not going to make a lot of difference. So you might then get them to pay 900 for it. Yeah, well, I think what Ranjan was saying there is if we can pitch it in the way that they know the four of us are involved and we're serious and we've got the cash and we're ready to go, they might accept that. That often wins. What are you two guys offering? What they are asking for, which is a 60-40 split, yep. subject to planning, obviously everything going, you know, all the DD stacking up, and we are splitting it down the middle, so that would be a 350 grand investment each. Hmm. On a maximum of, what, 900 grand? 800-ish. Yeah, I think we well, can work that. Well, I think you need to be a bit more precise, don't you, Anjan? I mean, you've... I, I've. Been... We were. We, I mean, the offer was clear. Maximum of 800 grand. I said that to them. We'll work that bit out. I don't think the price needs to be set in stone right now, does it? Okay. So you have an offer. But um, we've got a track record of doing it, not being the highest bidder in the room. That doesn't, and that's the way that you do doesn't it. surprise me, Ran Janet, to be honest with you. Oh, <laughs> not being with you. let me clarify. Not being the highest bidder in the room and winning the property. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> miracles do happen. So you've got, a, you've got two offers from what I can understand. You've got an offer from Ran Jan on his own. Yeah. You've got an offer with Ranjan and Paul together to work as, as a, a, a both both of them together with you with you both so um or you you or you can walk away and do it in a different way on your own so uh my view is more the merrier yeah I think I mean, so take yeah both experience good choice brilliant well done congratulations well done, Thank you much. <laughs> well, done. Great. well done really investable weren't yeah. they yeah what, what a dream team, an accountant really nice. and a planner together, keeping each other ambitious but, but realistic, sensible. Mm. Great deal, guys. I mean, if, they, if they get that at the right price and with the planning, fantastic. If mm. they don't, they'll find something else yeah. better. Yes, definitely. Totally, totally. I think you've got two really good people to work with, Ranjan and Paul. Congratulations. I, as you know, don't like sharing. Um, and Nicholas, I'm surprised okay, you didn't jump yeah. in as well and Helen but it just, for me it's just a bit it's going to be too expensive to do it. So not a lot so not a bad little project I mean the key points of that deal if you like is the look of the building from the outside the look of the building doesn't look like a commercial building so therefore when you convert it to residential use because it's not a sort of bargly 1970s type of building it's re relatively attractive from the outside the end values would be very similar to purpose-built residential uh, flats in the area. There's a bit of debate over the build costs, but I think um, they're roughly around right because they have worked in harmony with the flow of the building to make sure there are no major structural alterations and that kind of thing. I think we managed to peg them back a little bit uh, in their excitement to get this deal because I think they were looking at offering too much to make this actually work. So the maximum price of 800K, when you work your figures back, gives you uh, that profit margin that you need to make the deal stack up in today's market. And of course, through knowledge of the permitted development criteria, we know that this will get permitted development in the 56 days uh, time. And that means you can make an offer uh, unconditionally not conditional on getting planning permission or anything like that, which means the vendor is more excited about taking it up. If you want to find out how you can do deals like this, then you really want to attend the same training that Cal Shelton attended, which is my eight week commercial property course. You can find out details for that at succeedingproperty.com forward slash workshop. If you've been on the course, and you're looking at stepping up your property investing game to the next level, I run a 12 month mastermind program. We take on a new intake each and every quarter. Our next intake is September 2022. You can find out details of that program and how to apply at succeedingproperty.com forward slash mastermind. Now back to Elizabeth who meets up with Cal and Ron after their pitch. Walk me through what happened then. Yeah, it went really well. Yeah. Really, really great start. I think Helen used the word exceptional to the uh, in relation to our uh, information we provided. So well, yeah, that kind of relaxed us straight from the off. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, heard that she said she wants to frame your your numbers. <laughs> so yeah. she obviously enjoyed that. That must have been very thorough. Yeah, and similar praise from Ranjan on the kind of consideration of the risks and stuff. So yeah, we're both. Brilliant. I was really happy. And, yeah. uh, Great feedback. Great investment as well. Yeah. So Excellent. That's what that. you came for. Yeah. So happy days. Yeah, Who's yeah. that with?
Uh, we had it with Paul and Ranjan, so two of them. Right. Which so they've done a little deal brilliant. together. Yeah, I thought, yeah. We were, thought we might get one. It sounded like we weren't going to get any for a little while there. Yeah. So you're happy with the results? Very happy. Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, what's, what's next? What's the next step? Uh, mm. It's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's final bids by this Friday. Yeah. So right. know, we've got a meeting with Ranjan and Paul Friday morning, and then we'll we'll get our offer in. Fingers crossed. Yeah, exactly. Good news over the weekend. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, hopefully it all works out for you. Thank you. And congratulations and thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. High streets across the land are changing forever. Basically, there's an oversupply of retail premises. Shops are closing down, more are going to close down in the future. The government know this, and that's why they've introduced, or they're introducing, a light touch planning system, which allows small developers to easily repurpose these buildings to residential use under a light touch planning regime called permitted development. Now, this is going to be the biggest revolution uh, and the biggest change and the biggest opportunity for property investors um, that I've ever seen and this is all coming into effect on 1st of August so you need to know what's happening and what properties to look for to take advantage of these opportunities so that you can get in there and take that first mover advantage. I've got a 90 minute free masterclass to get you ready for August the 1st. Make sure you join me, click the link below. Whether you're a beginner or expert, we'll get you started.